Well, it is week two of a teaching series, which is just a collection of talks called Right Side Up. You guys enjoying this so far? If you've been in church for a minute, here's where this title came from. If you've been in church for a minute, you may have heard someone say, uh, we've heard it a bunch, um, Jesus came to flip things upside down. I've even heard people say, Jesus came to build the upside down kingdom. And honestly, we just respectfully disagree. We think that if we're going this way and Jesus is going this way, that we've got it wrong, not him. If somebody's upside down, it's us, not him. And so he came to not turn things upside down. He came to turn things right side up. That's what we believe. And, and last week, Doug kicked it off with an incredible message. I don't know what he talked about. I just remember his daughter hanging upside down. That's just scared me to death. I'll be honest. <laughs> I was going to try to hold my, my middle son upside down today and remembered he's bigger than me now, so that won't work. Um, now, he did a message called Holiness in a Half-Hearted World, and it was dope. If you missed it, you got to go check it out. Um, today, I'm starting a two-week message. I'm going to finish it next week unless I get long-winded and then we'll go another week with it. But I'm so fired up about this topic. To me, if we don't get this one right, we miss everything else God has for us. If we don't get this one right, it changes the way we relate with God, which changes every other part of our lives. So we got to get this one right. So we're starting this multi-week teaching that I'm going to be doing. It's called Grace in a Get-What-You-Deserve World. Grace in a get-what-you-deserve world. I like this title because the truth is, I don't have to tell you, but let's talk about it for a minute. We've all been taught, we've been raised to believe and understand that we live in a get-what-you-deserve world. It's just true, right? I mean, since we were children, you do what you're supposed to, you get a treat. You don't, you get a timeout. You get what you deserve, I've read parenting books that say you want to positively reinforce what you want to see. There are great parenting books that teach us, teach your children, you get what you deserve. You do what I say, I bring you Krispy Kreme. You don't, you take a third nap. You see what I'm saying, right? We get what you, get what you deserve. We've, we've learned, then we go to school, and you do well on the test, you get an A. You don't, you get an F. And we're going to tell your parents, we're going to tattle on you and tell your parents every single semester how you're doing, just how well you are getting what you deserve. You try hard, you get better grades. You slack off, you get worse grades. You get what you deserve. A lot of us uh, played sports growing up. I, played, I loved sports growing up. It was the one thing that I felt like I could be good at, the only thing in this world I felt like I could be good at. And, and then I hit like you know teenage years and realized, nope, you're not even good at that anymore. You're just average at best. So then I just learned to talk trash better. Same thing. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be the best player on every single team. So if I'm playing baseball, I'm in the batting cages nonstop. You might be taking the summer off, not me. I lived in Kansas. Everything in Kansas is put together with bailing wire. I took bailing wire off hay bales, and I bailing wired a tire onto a fence. And I went out there every day and threw hundreds of pitches. Oh, you're just playing games this summer. I'm getting better at baseball. And because I'm working harder, I'm going to get more playing time. I'm going to be the starting pitcher next season. Why? Because I've already figured it out. You get what you deserve, right? And then I went to college. Same thing. There's a set amount of requirements, credits. If you earn enough credits, if you fulfill all the requirements, you get a diploma. If you are one credit short, you don't get the diploma. You get what you deserve. And then we go to work. Same thing. I'm going to be honest with you. Before I got saved, I got fired from almost every job I ever had. I expected more laughter out of that. <laughs> oh, I guess it's not really funny. It's true. Um, somebody over here, security, watch out for this laugh. Um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Apparently, if you don't show up and you don't call and tell them you're not going to show up multiple times in the same month, they will let you go. You get what you deserve. On the flip side, you put in extra hours. You make the company better. You make more sales. You increase productivity. You go above and beyond. You get promotions. You get raises. You get what you deserve. Relationships, same thing. If I'm good to you, you might stay around. If I treat people poorly, they're probably going to leave. We just get what we deserve in every area of our life. We're used to it. 
I think it's what makes accepting grace so difficult. Because Jesus came to bring us this thing called grace. And it is the absolute opposite of get what you deserve. And I think that's what makes it tough. I know that's what makes it tough for me. If you, if you Google the definition of grace or read commentaries or read many theologians, most theologians will, will agree. The wording's sometimes slightly different, but there's a basic general definition of grace that we have been operating as the church under for a long time, and it goes like this. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, and unearned favor and kindness from God. Unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor and kindness from God. That's the opposite of get what you deserve. Jesus came and he said, I know everything else in your life is on a get what you deserve basis, but when it comes to you and your creator, that is absolutely upside down. I came to bring you grace and flip this thing right side up. You're going to get a relationship with your God that you could never earn, deserve, or merit. It's called grace. And, and I'm going to read four verses. Now, the, I read this week that the Bible uses the word grace 170 times. To be fair, I didn't count. I'm assuming they're fairly accurate. The point is, if God tells us that that many times, it's probably pretty important that we get it, isn't it? I want to read just four verses that to me sort of will give us a baseline of where grace came from, how we get it, and what it is. Okay, ready? Put up those four verses, if you would, all at the same time. I'm just going to read them off this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What we deserve, because we're, we're sinful, every single one of us, we've all messed up, we've all sinned, and God is perfect. So what we deserve is eternal separation from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. And God said, that's not, that's not going to happen, not with my kids. That's not good enough. I'm going to send my son. He's going to die on a cross. He's going to pay the price. They can receive salvation. They can receive forgiveness. They get my spirit inside of them. They get heaven forever with me, and they don't ever have to earn it or deserve it. I'm going to flip this thing right side up. Who qualifies for this? Because I'm pretty messed up. Everyone, no matter what you've done, no matter what has been done to you, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you struggle with right now, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's grace. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I get to simply say, please forgive me of my sins. I want to receive that salvation. And I get righteousness, which is perfect right standing with God. I get to be seen by God as perfect because of what Jesus did on the cross. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I didn't merit it. I get it. It's called grace. He flipped it. And here it is, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't merit it. It's a gift of God, not by works. And nobody gets to boast. That's grace. I have struggled with this ever since I've been a Christian. And I so badly want you to get, I want you to get this one in your soul. And my fear this week was, is I'm just not articulate enough to help you do that. Like, I don't have the right words. I'm so worried all week. Like, what if I don't say the right words and you don't really get it? Because this, this is huge. Like, this is, the, this is our foundation. And I woke up one morning and I was praying. I was like, God, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have. I had 18 pages of notes. I want so much I wanted to say. And I'm like, there's not a chance in the world Conrad sits through 18 pages of notes. So I got to do something different. And I just felt like God dropped this thought in my heart. And it was... You be real and raw and honest, and I'll do the talking. And so that's what we're praying for. Amen? Let's pray. God, we need you to speak to us today. I don't have the right words. Would you take my imperfect words and communicate this unbelievably life-changing message to every single one of us today? In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So if I'm real and raw and honest, this is tough for me, this topic, because of what we've already talked about. In fact, I started writing down a list this week of how I feel 
when I don't accept God's grace as truth and fact in my life. Sometimes, like you, let's be honest, my feelings supersede his truth in my mind. Right? Like, I, like I, I was talking to a guy in my office not too long ago, and he said, I've messed up and da-da-da-da-da, and he said, I've repented, but I just don't feel forgiven. I said, well, you're not forgiven because you feel forgiven. You're forgiven because God's word says you're forgiven, and his word trumps our feelings every day. We get grace, not because we feel like we deserve it, but because God's word says we get it, and his word trumps our feelings. But when I get this wrong, here's some things I deal with. I feel unworthy. Struggled with that my whole life. Just have. And uh, in fact, I got brought to church when I was 24 years old. I was a suicidal drug addict, had drugs in my pocket. I was a mess. And I could feel it in my heart. This is what I need. I need God in my life. I didn't want to raise my hand. I didn't want to say yes to Jesus because I just knew I'll never be good enough to earn this stuff. I can't, I'm looking around the church going, I can't be like these people. I'm not good like these people. I'll never be able to keep up this act. And I don't have the energy to pretend to be something I'm not. I don't think I'll ever be worthy enough for this thing. It almost kept me from giving God a chance. And then, and then what I found out is the longer I've been a Christian and I screw something up, the more guilt I feel. Because in my mind, I needed grace back then, but I ought to be a lot better by now. I shouldn't be still messing with that. And so I screw up, and then I feel like now I'm completely unworthy because my feelings supersede the fact that I get grace. I don't feel like God would want me. When I got saved, someone said, hey, just he's your heavenly father. Talk to him like you would a father. I haven't had great luck with fathers. That was tough for me. To this day, when I pray, I very rarely say, Heavenly Father. It's hard for me. I never felt like he would actually want me because I know how screwed up I am. And you'll deal with that too. You know how screwed up you are. And why would a perfect God actually want me? Because I feel unworthy. I don't feel like I can walk in my calling. I look around, I go, I just don't deserve it. I don't deserve... I don't deserve to do what I do for a living. I don't deserve to have the family that I have and the wife that I have and the friends that I have. And I, I don't deserve the blessings that God has put in my life. And because and I, I know it, I know what a mess I am. I know my track record. I know the things I still struggle with. I don't deserve this stuff. I don't feel like I deserve it. I feel shame. I try real hard to pursue God. I try real hard to get in the word and to talk to him and to be a good man and to be the person God's called me to be and to be spiritual. And then I feel like, man, there's just times I don't feel like I'm very good at it. I don't feel worthy to do what he's called me to do. I, I feel this underlying level of shame. So I feel like I'm always trying, 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 but always carrying around this little gut feeling of I'm just not good enough, but I'll keep trying, but I'm never going to be good enough, but I'll keep trying. And it's like this low, low lying shame that just sort of taints everything. And so I'm constantly trying to perform better to get God to like me. It's an exhausting way to live. And what I realized when I made my list is every single thing I put started with, I feel I feel unworthy. I feel like he wouldn't want me. I feel like I can't do this. I feel like he's not with me. I feel like he wouldn't like me. I feel like he's not proud of me. His word supersedes our feelings, church. He brought grace, and we don't earn it or deserve it or merit it. He flipped the whole thing right side up. He said, it is a gift. If you've ever felt like when it comes to God, I'm just not enough, today's for you. And if right now you feel like, I'm fantastic, <laughs> keep this sermon in your back pocket. Because <laughs> life happens, doesn't it? Let's go through that definition, because I believe, as we saw, the, the Word of God definitely supports that definition of unmerited, unearned, and undeserved. So let's go through those. Unmerited. I was thinking about that word this week, and uh, I was like, man, I don't, I don't ever use the word merit, ever. I just don't. And, and I was like, where have I heard it? And I'm like, merit badge. I've heard of a merit badge. 
the Boy Scout thing. I wasn't a Boy Scout. I hate camping and don't like being told what to do. Why would I be a Boy Scout? <laughs> but they have merit badges. So I was like, well, what, what, what's a merit? I Googled merit badges. It listed all the badges, and then under every single one, you know what it listed? The requirements to get it. If you fulfill the requirements and check every box, you get the badge. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's how I have felt about God at times. I remember right after I got saved, thinking, I want to do this thing right. God gave me a second chance. And, and I turned all these wonderful opportunities for me to get closer to God into boxes or requirements that I needed to check off. I got to pray every day. I, I got to read my Bible every day. I, I got to go to church every week. Check, check, check. I, I got to stop drinking. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop. Check, check, check. If I could fulfill the requirements, and I, and I kind of, and my whole week went, man, I fulfilled most of those requirements. I think God kind of likes me this week. The problem is, and you know this, there's weeks when we don't do very good at our check marks, isn't there? And isn't it, isn't it true I mean, I haven't read my Bible in a while. I'm in a church in a minute. One thing I pray about is like, help me not get a speeding ticket. Bless this food. And if that goes on for a little bit, isn't it true that something in our soul, we say things like, I just feel far from God right now. It's I feel. Not it's I am. It's I feel. I don't feel like he's that happy with me right now because I haven't done very well at checking off the boxes. That's when I know I've gotten it upside down again. Let's reread Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I, I want this to so get in your soul before you leave here today. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. This is not from yourselves. It doesn't matter if you've had a good week or a bad week. He loves you the same. He values you the same. It's not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, not by checking off requirements so that nobody can boast. You didn't make this happen. I didn't make this happen. Right? But we get it so twisted, don't we? God says, listen, it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus already did. It's a gift. It's a free gift that you don't deserve and haven't earned and don't merit. I just want you, son, to receive it. I just want you, daughter, to receive it. It'll change you. One time, uh, one of my boys came to me, and uh, he had done some things he shouldn't. He was very broken up about it. And he came to me real upset, and he's like, I'm sorry, Dad. And uh, I just hugged him. And I just, I just held that hug for a minute. I'm like, I'm not going to let you go. I want you to feel that I don't love you any less because of this. And then I just got this idea. I didn't, just got an idea, and I was like, hey, get in the car. I think he thought I was moving him out. <laughs> I go, get in the car. He goes, why? <clears throat> I said, get in the car. We went to the mall. We walked into Foot Locker. He said, what are we doing? I said, son. Pick a pair, any pair. He said, why? He said, Dad, I don't deserve this. I said, I know. I said, son, there's this thing called grace. And I want you to feel today what your heavenly father feels about you today. Pick a pair. And every time you put this pair on, we had worked out a deal. Every time you put this pair of shoes on, you remember my Heavenly Father loves me no matter what. And I didn't deserve this. I didn't earn this. I didn't merit this. And I looked at him. I said, you do it again, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Today, <laughs> pick a pair. Hey, I'm just a human. A human, human dad. I wanted him to see you're not going to lose my love or God's love, even on the days when you don't merit it. God said, I want to make sure my kids understand this, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you feel like all you've done 
is make mistakes recently? Can you just hear your heavenly father go, pick a pair. I got you. I've never loved you more. Because it's not about what you did. It's about what my son did. And you're perfect in my sight. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. Romans 3.24 says, all are justified. That's, that's us. And we're in the all. No matter what's happened, all are justified, redeemed, made perfect in God's sight freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What's it say? Jesus paid for everything. Stop trying to deserve it. Because <laughs> you can't. Deserve and earn to me are like, like two sides of the same coin. If I don't deserve it, it means I've done bad things and don't deserve it. And if I haven't earned it, then I haven't done enough good things and don't get it. I struggle with this don't deserve thing. And so do you because we've, we've grown up in a get what you deserve world. And I, and I know when I'm, when I'm getting it upside down because, again, my feelings take over and they supersede the truth somehow in my mind. And here's what happens. I sin. And right after that, I think this is, this is not the time to read the Bible. God doesn't want to talk to me right now. This is not the time to pray. And I need guidance. I need help from my dad. I need a miracle in my life. I can't ask for that today. Because look what I just did. Let me put together, come on, you know, let me put together about three good days and then I'll ask. Why? Because in my mind, his affections for me are dependent on whether or not I've deserved it. So let me be good for a few days so I can start to deserve it again. I don't want to go to church right now. I don't want to be around church people right now. I might skip small group this week because I feel really guilty. Let me get a good week, and then I'll go be spiritual guy again. Then God will want me again. Let me deserve this thing for a few days, and then I'll come back to the Father. We feel that, right? It's upside down. I'm a dad. Very imperfect one, but it's, it's one of my favorite things in this world. And one of the most heartbreaking things as a dad is when I'm talking to one of my boys and then I find out something's been going on, they've been struggling, and I'll say something like this, son, why didn't you tell me? And my son will say, I didn't want to disappoint you. Somehow in my son's mind, if I know that things are screwed up, I might love him less. He doesn't want to risk that. So he, he, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to come to me with that. He wants to wait until he can get past that struggle and then come hang out with me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I do that with God. It's when I get grace upside down. And I told my son, son, no, no, no. I don't love you because you did good things this week or because you did bad things this week. I love you because you're my son. And you can come to me with anything, anytime. And listen, especially when things are screwed up, especially when you're hurting, especially when you're struggling, that's when you run to me. Don't avoid me. That's when you need me most, and that's when I want to be there for you most. You know, God says the exact same thing to us. 1 John 3.1, he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us because we've deserved it? No, because we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God says, I don't love you because of what you've done. I don't love you because of whether you avoided that sin this week or not. I love you because you're my son. I love you because you're my daughter. Do not get this thing twisted. And he says, and whatever you do, when things get messed up in your life, don't ever avoid me because of it. Run to me because of it. Let us then approach God's throne room of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us win in our time of need. 
God says, there's nothing you can't bring to me. There's nothing you can't tell me. There's, there's no screw up, no sin, no addiction. No, I fell back into it. No, I promised I wouldn't do it, and I did it again. There's nothing that you can't bring to me. And the millisecond after something goes wrong, don't you dare avoid me. Understand grace and sprint to my presence and accept my love and accept my mercy. It's unmerited. It's undeserved, and it's unearned. But me, what I do is I try to do enough good things so that God will like me. If I do enough good things, maybe Dad will be proud. It's the opposite of grace. It's, not, it's absolutely the wrong way of thinking, but it still creeps into my mind. And so there's things like I could pray today. Now, on a polygraph test, I'd have to tell you there are times that I go pray, not because I want to talk to God, but because I want him to like me more. And I feel like if I don't, he won't. And he's like, I just want you to be able to talk to me some. There's no guilt. This is an opportunity. Sometimes I read the Bible, not because I want to hear from God about my life, because I feel guilty if I don't. Because I still feel like I got to do the right things so that he'll like me. When I, when I was a little kid, um, we were at my, my grandma's house, and, and my, my stepdad, and he was not a, like, tell you I love you, tell you I'm proud of you kind of guy. Just wasn't his thing. And, and we were at my grandma's house, and we saw my Uncle Tom's bedroom. They, they had left it after he had moved out. And, and he walked me in there, and he goes, you see this? And his, his room had trophies, literally on shelves all around the entire room. And he goes, now that's something. In my head, I went, okay, game on. I know how to impress my dad. Hundreds and hundreds of pitches in the backyard and extra hours in the batting cages and shooting hoops until the sun goes down and juggling a soccer ball until my legs hurt. I'll do whatever it takes to win another trophy. And in my room as a kid, I stacked up trophies all along my windowsill, all growing up. And you could come to me at any time and go, hey, what was that one? And I'd probably be like, I don't even remember. Like, what's it say? I could care less about him. What I realized is I spent my whole childhood trying to stack up trophies to make my dad proud. That's what I was doing. And then I went, whoa, am I still doing that with God? Am I still trying to stack up trophies so that God will like me? And I started looking back going, and I've been struggling this the whole time I've been following God. Hey, God, I, I prayed every day this week. Am I good enough? Went to church again. Hey, God, I'm going to move to Denver, and Scott said I can join his team, and we can start a church. Are you proud yet? Hey, God, we just got put in that fast-growing church magazine. Are you proud of me yet? Hey, God, we're going to start another campus. Am I good enough? God, 800 people got baptized last week. Do you like me now? I've been stacking up trophies, trying to get God's approval. And I think God's, God's the whole time is going, son, stop. You don't have to stack up trophies for me to love you. I love you because you're my son. You don't earn this thing. It's because it's who you are to me. Last year, um, we took my son Ethan to college for his freshman year. And I cried 10 buckets of tears. Hated it. Hate the whole thing. I don't like the growing up. I don't like the going away. I don't like any of it. Before we took him, we had one last meal together as a family. I called it the Last Supper. In retrospect, not the best <laughs> terminology. I texted my wife and my other two boys during the day, and I said, hey, um, I want to make this really special, and so we're going to go around the table, and we're going to talk about the things that we're going to miss most, and, and the things that we love most about Ethan. And, and then we got to dinner, and I was so ready for this special moment, and so I looked at one of his brothers, and I went, you go first. And he's like, oh, I'm going to love that you're going away, and I can use all your shoes. <laughs> I 
son, this is not the special moment I had in mind. I forgot I have boys and they mock everything. Well, I took mine seriously. And so I said, Ethan, I'm going to miss when we're just riding in the car and we listen to country music and we just start talking about life. I'm going to miss being out in the backyard, shooting hoops, asking you about girls. I'm going to miss sitting on the back porch late at night when we just talk about random stuff. I'm going to miss when you see my sermon notes laying around and you read them and critique them. And then I said this, I said, you know what I'm going to miss most? I'm going to miss watching you try. It's my favorite thing to do. I love watching you try at basketball. I love watching you try at school. I love watching you try to become a man of God. I don't care how many trophies you get. I don't care if you win or lose. I don't care if you achieve every dream in the world or fail at everything you try. I, lo I love watching you try because you're my son. You're my daughter. I just like being with you and watching you do life. You never earn that. You never deserve that. You never earn enough trophies for that. You never merit that. You're just my boy, and I just love watching. I'm so proud of you. Could you hear the God of the universe saying to you today, son, daughter, you don't have to keep trying to deserve this. You don't have to keep feeling shame and trying to earn this back. You don't have to keep stacking up trophies to try to merit my love and my affection. You're my child and you've got it. You get grace in a get what you deserve world. Not because you feel it, because I decided it. And my decision trumps your feelings every single day. Accept it and just enjoy it and walk in it. There's freedom there. What if you were to say, you know what, though? I, I carry this shame with me, and I understand the concepts of grace, but I can never quite actually like experience it and live it and walk in it. Don't miss next week, because that's what we're going to talk about. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you that you're with us right now. I thank you that you're speaking to us right now. You're speaking to our hearts. You're speaking to our minds. God, would you help us understand how much you love us right this second? Would you just help us break down that invisible wall and just go, okay, I receive it. I've never earned it, but I, I'll take it. And would you help us to experience the lightness and the freedom that comes with that? With everyone's eyes closed, I want to ask two questions, give you a chance to respond. The first one is this. I am a Christian. Maybe I've been one for a long time. And the truth is, I have a hard time accepting grace for myself. And today, I just want to say, God, help me get past this mental roadblock. Help me to experience your grace and to walk in that freedom. If that's you, raise your hand, and I'm just going to pray for you. Yeah, a bunch of us. All right, the second question is this. You don't have a relationship with God yet. You may not have even known what you were doing coming to this service today or tuning in online today. But the truth is, you can feel it right now in your heart. God is trying to draw you, lovingly drawing you into a relationship with him. You can feel it. You're like, man, I need this grace. Today, I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to experience his salvation. I want to experience forgiveness of my sins. I want his spirit to be inside of me. I want heaven forever, and I can feel it in my heart. Today is my day. If that's you right now, raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer for you. Raise them up. Oh, come on. Praise God. 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 Yes. Yeah. God behind bars. Raise them up. Come on. Austin, Texas, Brussels. Raise them up. God, we need you. God, I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now, literally around the world. I pray that as we begin to worship you with music, that we would sense your presence in such a real and authentic way. I thank you for the life change that is happening. And God, for every one of us who says, I struggle with this concept, even as we start worshiping, God, would you help us to start 
realizing it's not about our feelings. It's about accepting our new reality with you. Help us to walk in that, accept your grace, experience your freedom, and live the life you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Let's stand up. Let's worship.